are recording this for people who are not able to come today. So if you do walk around, you might be heard but not seen because oh, <laughs> our camera's so, right there. Sure. So, so do you have a preference moment? Well, I want you to be comfortable. So, so yeah. If you stay in this area, basically around here, like if you, yeah, if you walk. Don't go past the pew. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, do you prefer having a stand or do you prefer uh, just you holding? Know what, I'll just hold it. That's okay. fine. Since you're going to yeah. walk the floor. And Are you going to say some things at the beginning? Yes, I will. Yes. Let's just go ahead and get started with our guest speaker. I'm delighted to welcome Father Scott Woods with us this morning, um, and he is going to lead us in our enrichment day for all of our Eucharistic ministers this morning. So thank you. Thank you, Molly. It's nice to be here again. I was first here 11 years ago. And it's a seminarian, one year uh, down, and now, how many years? Seven years of priesthood down. So, uh, wait, it was 2010, so more than that, 12 years ago. I still have my bottle of wine with the anniversary logo in my place. <laughs> I haven't cracked it open. Um, I uh, actually don't tell Father John because he'll send me collection envelopes, but I am uh, very fortunate that about a year ago, I was able to get a place, a little place on Catawba Island. So I live among you. Like I said, don't tell him because he'll send me collection envelopes since I'm in the boundaries. I, I have a Port Clinton address, so I'm paying taxes here. But it's a uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm doing my part, Carol, you know. Um, but, you know, it's been such a good thing. So I go there on my day off, and uh, I pray better there. And uh, I never would have uh, been drawn to do something like that. I wasn't looking for a place. It sort of fell into my lap, the opportunity. And I never would have done that had I not lived among you uh, 12 years ago and become familiar with the beauty and the hospitality of uh, this area along the lakeshore. So I'm grateful for that. And um, so I, I had no trouble getting here, Molly, because I just came from the condo on Catawba. And, uh, and the dog is still there. I didn't think you all wanted him here. I have my uh, mother and father's... Uh, 50, almost 15-year-old miniature schnauzer. Uh, six months before my mom died suddenly, and I was here last just after that happened, and you were so kind to me. Um, she had said to me, if anything ever happens to me, Scott, you better take care of that dog. And so the dog is there, and the air conditioner's running since the windows are closed for the rain, because tomorrow's my mother's birthday, and I don't want her haunting me. So anyway, it's... Uh, 
I, I'm grateful to Jan for the invitation. She extended the invitation in January, right before I picked up a little more work. Uh, in addition to being the pastor in Gibsonburg and Millersville, I'm also the presbyteral moderator, the acting pastor of St. Anne and St. Joseph in Fremont through June 30th. But a pastor has been appointed for July 1st, so thanks be to God. So um, I'm grateful to be here. It's good to be with you. And uh, I'm always happy to talk about the liturgy. Uh, as we were opening up the presentation, I said half the presentations in here are for Immaculate Conception, so I hope I don't let you down. Um, let's enter into prayer on this Feast of St. Matthias the Apostle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord our God, in every age you raise up women and men to serve your holy people and to glorify you. We give thanks this May 14th for St. Matthias the Apostle, whose memory the church honors. We recall how in the Acts of the Apostles, Matthias was chosen by the Spirit because he was an eyewitness to the resurrection of the Lord. And so he was called to join the Eleven and proclaim the good news of God's love to all the world. Through his intercession, help us to recognize that in every Eucharist, we too are eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ your Son. And let that encounter with the risen Lord move us, as it did Mary Magdalene, to run and tell the good news to those who are afraid and hopeless. We ask this through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So um, this morning, you're all Eucharistic ministers, right? I'm on the right presentation? Good, phew. Um, last November, the bishops of the United States issued a document on the Eucharist. Now, it's hard to find anything new to say. That said, we can never exhaust the mystery of God, right? We don't have the words or the comprehension to fully understand or explain the mystery. Although God has revealed himself in word and sacrament so that we can know him. And so the bishops acknowledge, well, we don't have a whole lot of new things to say. This document was pretty infamous before it was published because originally it was thought that this would address Catholics in public life and who may receive Holy Communion and who may not. That is not what the document does. The document addresses that just slightly towards the end because it acknowledges the sinfulness of all of us and the call to be authentic when we approach the altar of the Lord, to make sure we're being genuine, to make sure we're truly in communion with the risen Lord and one another. And so I don't know if many of you have had the opportunity. I mean, you, you all here are so good uh, at providing uh, renewal opportunities in this parish. You excel at that, just like this morning. And the fact that so many of you are here, thank you for that. It's a great witness to our diocese, the way you take this so seriously in Port Clinton. Uh, so maybe you've already looked at this document, and if so, I apologize, and I hope that maybe I'll have some new insight to share. But I thought this would be a good guide for us as we think about our own ministry to the Eucharist and to the body of Christ, the people of God to whom we minister. All right, so let's go ahead, Molly. The document's called The Mystery of the Eucharist and the Life of the Church. It's available online at usccb.org. You can Google it. You can print it out, as I did, and mark it up. And uh, I'm sure the bishops will be happy to even sell you a copy of it in hard print. But you can get it for free. So I'm sorry this is kind of small, but it'll be bigger on other slides. It's not a long document, only about 30 pages, and it's very understandable. It's not in church ease, if you will. Um, brief introduction. There's a brief conclusion called Sent Forth. But the two main areas of the document are called The Gift and Our Response. And I want to walk you through how our bishops, as successors to the apostles, are helping us understand how the gift of the Eucharist and the demand, then, that the Eucharist places on our lives. So we'll go forward then, Molly. Thank you. Okay, one more going forward. And then 
Um, the, the bishops begin by reflecting, obviously, in the context of the pandemic that we are hopefully emerging from to endemic status. Um, but they recall this moment, and maybe you watched it on live television, a Friday in Lent, Pope Francis all alone in St. Peter's Square. And it was a stunning moment to see only the Holy Father in that massive place where sometimes one million people gather. And after uh, imploring the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary, health of the sick, he then um, had a period of Eucharistic exposition and then offered benediction with the most blessed sacrament as he's doing in this photo, blessing the world in the midst of the beginning of this pandemic. And so the uh, bishops say the Pope was reminding us that even in a time of turbulence and crisis, Jesus is present among us, as present as he was long ago in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Now, Part of the difficulty, of course, we remember how our churches were closed for five or six weeks, and we can discuss in hindsight whether that was the best response or not. That's not our purpose here. But we know the pain of being distant from the Eucharist. I should say, you know the pain. I was still celebrating the Eucharist, and that's when all of us started live streaming, and kudos to you for installing that opportunity here for folks who are homebound. Uh, and we were offering the Eucharist, we priests, for you, every day, for your intentions. And so while our churches were closed to the public, the work of the people continued. The Eucharist was still celebrated daily for the good of the church and the world. And uh, in the midst of it, though, as we had spiritual communion for that time, did we not feel the closeness of the Lord in the midst of it? Even if we were not receiving his sacramental presence, I think in the midst of the chaos and the unknowing, all of us here would say we did recognize his presence in some way. And that's what the Holy Father was reminding us of. Sunday, they say, is not only the remembrance of a past event, it is the celebration of the living presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his own people. And so uh, a good reminder that what we do here is not a history lesson. The scriptures are not a history lesson of this man named Jesus from Nazareth and what he did 2,000 years ago, that he preached the gospel and healed people. It's not a history lesson about this prophet named Isaiah who lived 2,700 years ago. It is the living word of God. It's an encounter with the living God. And so Sunday's not a remembrance. It is our actual place at the Lord's table, just as in the Last Supper. Just make sure you're not like Judas, okay? Uh, but they, in terms of the effects from the pandemics, the bishops acknowledge for many of us, and I would think for us in this room, our faith was strengthened. We, came, we looked forward to coming back to the Lord's table. We hungered for it. And that's why for some of us, we were even upset at the leaders of the church for closing the churches in the first place. Again, not here to rehash that. Just acknowledging that that's what some of us felt. And so our faith was strengthened. But we know, because I think in every parish in this diocese, the pews are a little less full on Sunday since the churches have reopened. And so for some, there's been a discouragement, and maybe because they got used to not receiving the Eucharist for those six weeks the churches were closed, or uh, maybe um, they still couldn't come because of compromised immunity, or someone in their family had compromised immunity, so they were still playing it safe and not going out because there were so many unknowns. And maybe they just became accustomed to the Eucharist, not, uh, not having the Eucharist. It's not a judgment of them, it's just the reality that it's like, oh, I was doing this all the time, but I guess I'm doing okay without it now. Of course, we know we're not really okay without it, and that's what the bishops are opening up to us. So here in the gift, this first of two main sections in the document, they talk about the sacrifice of Christ in the Eucharist as a gift, the real presence of Christ, of course, and communion with Christ and the church, that these are the gifts of the Eucharist. 
So looking first at the sacrifice of Christ, and here we, of course, have the beautiful ceiling of our mother church, Rosary Cathedral. You know, when bishops come for installations of a bishop in Toledo or the funeral of a bishop, uh, they are always in envy of our cathedral. And uh, th they are overwhelmed by it. And in fact, when the folks from Toledo, Spain, came to Toledo uh, in the 80s and went and visited Rosary Cathedral, which is the only cathedral in the world designed in the Spanish Plateresque style as uh, deference to Toledo, Spain, the sister city relationship, these folks from Toledo said, we can't believe there's a cathedral like this in the United States. And so it's a real treasure and belongs to all of us, even if we live in Port Clinton or Gibsonburg or Millersville. But here, this part of the ceiling over the bishop's chair, the cathedra, that's the sacrificial bay. So architecturally, you know, each span in between windows is called a bay. And so this is the bay of sacrifice. Obviously, there's the crucifixion, mother of sorrows, above the crucifixion. And over here, there's the sacrifice of Isaac, by Abraham. So it's the Bay of Sacrifice. And of course, all that Eucharistic imagery, since the altar used to be right under the Baldacchino there. And so um, the sacrifice of Christ in the Eucharist, the bishops acknowledge there's, of course, a relationship between evil and selfishness. At the, at the root of any evil in the world is human selfishness, they say. And they remind us that sin is an offense against God, a failure to love God and our neighbor, which wounds our nature and injures human solidarity. Now, I think a lot of Catholics know that first part, right? That sin is, uh, well, I, I've offended God. But we forget, while that's the crossbar here, there's also this vertical connection in sin, right? That my sin hurts others. It's not just my relationship with God. And our communion in Eucharist is with Christ and Christ's church, his people. That's why sin is such a big deal. And it's a reminder to us, I think, of imperfect versus perfect contrition. Now, I won't put any of you on the spot to see if you remember your Baltimore catechism. But, of course, imperfect contrition, the church teaches, is I'm sorry for my sins because I'm afraid of hell, right? And the church says that's enough for the forgiveness of sins. That fear is enough. Because underneath it, of course, is a longing for life with God. But what we want to get to as we mature in our faith is to attain perfect contrition, which is to recognize that I am sorry for my sins because I've offended God and others, right? So I'm sorry because I've damaged relationship, not just fear, but I've done harm to a relationship. I've fallen out of communion, in other words. And so this is a good reminder that sin is a failure to love God and others, too. The bishops go on to say, without the grace of Christ received at baptism, strengthened in confirmation, and nourished by the Eucharist, this selfishness dominates us. That statement really struck me to the core, to say why you and I need Eucharist. Because without it, without Christ, in other words, which, duh, right? Selfishness dominates us. And so it's a reminder that the sacraments are, as we say, efficacious. They change us. Before I went to the seminary and was working as a campus minister at the University of Toledo, if we didn't have mass at the parish that day, if we had a communion service instead and I wasn't presiding at it, I would sometimes go to 7 o'clock mass at Rosary Cathedral. Now, mass at Corpus Christi was at noon. Rosary Cathedral, 7. And in campus ministry, it's not uncommon to work till 10 or 11 because at night because that's when the students are able to do things, right, in the evening. And so it was a sacrifice to go to 7 a.m. Mass. Oh, God has a sense of humor because my first assignment was Finley St. Michael. Mass was at 7 every day. <laughs> but the, the point I want to make is I recognized in myself, well, I didn't see it in the moment. Months out or years out, I could see how that daily encounter with the risen Lord 
was changing me, was changing how I looked at people, how I thought of people, the energy I put into being judgmental, where I could put that energy into something more fruitful. In other words, even though I wasn't aware of it, I knew it here, but I didn't feel it here necessarily, the sacraments were effective. They were doing their work on me. And that's the point here. We need the Eucharist because without that encounter with Christ, who is selfless, even to the point of death on a cross, then the selfishness remains powerful within us. And so they go, the bishops, of course, remind us of that very selfless, sacrificial love that Jesus makes explicit that his impending death, freely embraced out of love, is sacrificial. He chooses to lay down his life. He doesn't have to do this. He is tempted again in the Garden of Gethsemane. He can say no to it, but he doesn't. And in that, he undoes the sin of Adam and becomes obedient to the point of death on a cross. And so they say, as a memorial, the Eucharist is is not another sacrifice. So this is in response especially to our Protestant brothers and sisters who don't believe in real presence, right? We're not doing this again. There was one effective sacrifice for all of human history. And so the Eucharist isn't another, but it's the, and this is where we have to get the pronunciation right, not a representation, but a representation of the sacrifice of Christ, by which we are reconciled to the Father. It is the way by which we are drawn into Jesus' perfect offering of love, which is why the presider says, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Because our participation in the Eucharist does not make us spectators. It's not a spectator sport. Instead, it draws us in this representation of the sacrifice of the cross in the sacrament of the cross draws us in to the sacrifice and then demands sacrificial love from us more than just statically receiving the incarnate logos, Greek word for the word, that Jesus is the eternal word, right? More than statically receiving, we enter into the very dynamic of his self-giving. That's what Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI said. And then, of course, there's an eschatological nature. Whew, there's your fancy Greek word for the day, eschatology, the study of the end time. Okay, the eschaton, what we're all aspiring to, what, in the, what we used to call in the old days the beatific vision, right? That's the eschaton, that's the end that we are all aiming for, I hope. And so the Eucharist is an eschatological gathering of the people of God, a real foretaste of heaven. And in art, in Rosary Cathedral, that is depicted most beautifully in the apse ceiling, this half dome. Because, brothers and sisters, we see down here, the way the cathedral has been designed, out here in the body of the church, people seated in the pews, we call the church militant, right? The church that's still making its way through the struggle of evil to the joys of heaven. And then you can't see it in this photo, but I have other photos. Behind The Baldacchino blocks it, but if you've taken a tour of the cathedral or been up here in the sanctuary and you look from the sides, right behind this, so this here it says, and one holy Catholic apostolic church, the marks of the church, right? Right above that stripe in the, behind this Baldacchino are flames with people reaching up out of it. It's a depiction of purgatory. We call that the church suffering, right? Suffering because they have been promised the opportunity to see God's face, but they're not there yet. And then, of course, up here in the ceiling, the words around the coronation scene, Ecclesia triumphans, church triumphant, right? The church in heaven. That together we're all the church, the church on earth, the church making its way to the face of God, and the church before God in heaven. And so here it's all depicted, the people out here, the church in purgatory, and then here all the saints, the apostles, John the Baptist, all of them 
the church in heaven. So when we gather in the cathedral church of the Diocese of Toledo, the art draws us into this history of the Eucharist as the eschaton, the foretaste of heaven. You still with me? Good. Let's go forward, Molly. And so then they move on about the real presence of Christ, of course. And so quoting St. John Chrysostom, Chrysostom means golden mouth. He was a great preacher, as you can see in this quote. He preached that when you see the body of Christ set before you on the altar, say to yourself, because of this body, I am no longer earth and ashes, no longer a prisoner, but free. Because of this, I hope for heaven and to receive the good things therein, immortal life, the portion of angels and closeness with Christ. And so the bishops remind us, again, there's nothing new here, but they're reminding us of how this happens. Again, we can explain why or the uh, how up to a point. That the priest presider sharing an apostolic ministry through the laying on of hands by the bishop, a successor to the apostles, stands before the community representing them and takes bread and wine received from the community and then invokes the power of the Holy Spirit. That's that Greek word, epiclesis. So when Father John goes like this, over the bread and wine, that's the epiclesis, the invocation of the Holy Spirit. Send forth your spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine. And I don't know, in some, if you do it here, in some parishes they ring bells at that moment because this is where it begins. It's not just the priest saying the words, take this all of you and eat of it, what we call the consecration, although that's really called the institution narrative, right? It's the, it's the priest saying the words of Jesus where he instituted the Eucharist, therefore the institution narrative. But in the epiclesis, the priest begs the Father to send the Holy Spirit so that when the priest, acting in the person of Christ, the head of the body, repeats the words of Jesus, lending his voice and hands to Christ, the Holy Spirit will, for our benefit and the good of the world, change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That's all the how we can do. Then it becomes faith, and we get to be Thomases who unfortunately has been being called Doubting Thomas. I really think he's believing Thomas. He wanted so badly to believe the Lord was risen, but he didn't want to be hurt again. Doubting Thomas, that's awful. Anyway, don't ever call him that again. And then, of course, they tell us this is one of the central mysteries of the Catholic faith. Again, we know this. It's not something new, but... The, Going back to Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, that yes, it's the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, but still the accidents of bread and wine, the substance of, of the appearance of bread and wine, the substance is changed, thus transubstantiation. The substance is changed, but the appearance remains for the sake of our senses, because who would eat flesh and drink blood? And then, of course, the uniqueness of Eucharistic presence among other modes of Christ's presence. So in the liturgy, we say that the presider, Christ is present in him, and Christ is present in the worshiping assembly, and Christ is present in the living word, which is nice that you got a nice ambo here. Congratulations on that. And, and uh, then, of course, amongst all of that, Christ is, is most beautifully, most powerfully present in the Eucharist. And so then they go on to remind us of the importance of amen. I think we take this word for granted, sisters and brothers. What does amen mean? I believe, right? I believe that Christ is present, but what else? <laughs> I mean, is, if that's, if that's a good start, but I believe also that I am called by Christ to become Christ for others. See, if it's just I believe here, well, see, it's just about God and me. <laughs> yeah, I believe Christ is present, so I, I got this part down. But Eucharist, we're reminded, has this part too, communion with one another. So Christ is present and will reserve his sacramental presence in the tabernacle for the sick and for Eucharistic adoration but I become a tabernacle. 
Not so I can go out in the world and be reverenced, but so that I can be the vessel that brings Christ into a world that doesn't always come into this sacred space where he dwells. So yes, I believe Christ is present and I believe I am called and I will go when the presider says or the deacon says, go forth, the mass has ended. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Or as the rector of my seminary would say to us, not in mass, but at the end of conferences, after he gave the blessing, he'd say, get out. All right. No, let's actually leave it for a moment. And so the, the, the bishops go on to remind us how our worship reflects this deep belief in real presence. And so in exposition or adoration, yes, there's a difference between those, and I'm going to address that at the next session. All right? Those are not the same things, those two words. And benediction, Eucharistic processions, 40 hours devotions. Do you do any 40 hours? Most parishes don't anymore, but um, some do. Uh, reverend genuflections, it drives me nuts. Because, you know, the, uh, the tabernacle's in the center, of the church is where I am as well, and people come in, and uh, let's say when the tabernacle was over here, some people come in, they just genuflect wherever. They don't even know what they're genuflecting to, right? And I, again, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, it's like, what a, we've done such a poor job of helping people understand that I genuflect out of reverence for the presence of Christ. But, you know, someone comes in and I'll just genuflect wherever, you know, I just got to get in the pew and that's what I do first. So remind people, it's for Christ. Um, Bowing the head prior to the reception of Holy Communion. In, in the general instruction of the Roman Missal, the bishops tell us that, as we know, since we've been doing since about 2002 or 2004, when we are about to receive Holy Communion, we make a profound bow of the head. Whether we'll receive on the hand or on the tongue, some people kneel and to receive um, at my parish, and maybe some of you do that or distribute Holy Communion. And, and we're never to stop people from doing that. That's a pious expression. Although I always like to say, do you think you know better than the bishops who are successors to the apostles? And I don't mean to be rude, but this is the moment of unity, communion with Christ and one another. And in the current rite, which has magisterial authority, teaching authority of the church, the bishops of the United States have said that when we approach the Lord in Holy Communion, we make a profound bow of the head. And we're supposed to do that together, not do our own thing. And so I, I don't say that if that's part of your party, I don't say that to be rude. It's just I am challenging you, though, to say this is the teaching. And I don't think we want to say we know better than the successors to the apostles. And, of course, refraining from food and drink for at least one hour. All of this, these things we do, reflect our firm belief in real presence. Okay, let's go. Molly, thank you. I gotta pick up the speed here. How late do I have, Jan? 10? 10? Okay, okay, I gotta get moving. I'm too windy. Okay, so now communion with Christ and the church. And so the Eucharist represents, not represents, represents this one sacrifice so that we are placed in communion with it and with the divine love from which it flows forth. We're placed in communion with each other through this love which is given to us. That is why we can say the Eucharist makes the church. Because at the center of the church, what do we pray in the Eucharistic prayer? In Eucharistic prayer three, the presider prays, uh, confirm your pilgrim church in faith and unity. Bring it to the fullness of charity. And what is charity? Love. And so it's in the Eucharist that we are brought together because the love of Christ joins us. Uh, and of course, this is one of the beautiful things, I think especially when someone loses a loved one, to share with them that it's at the altar here, here, brothers and sisters, that we are joined to our loved ones who have gone before us. That there's, as we just talked about in the cathedral, I mean, we can't see it, but there's this mystical thing happening here. And of course, in old church architecture when there was a high altar. It, it sort of helped visualize that, but it's no less real. 
that as the presider stands here and the, the church on earth is gathered, the angels are surrounding us. Our loved ones are joined to us. The Eucharist is one triumphant hymn of praise. That's why before the Holy Holy, the presider says, therefore with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as with one voice we acclaim. It's the hymn of heaven and earth joined together. When our loved ones are closer to us here, even in death, than when they were physically right next to us, at this altar we're joined. That's hopeful. That's a beautiful teaching from our church. And then the obligation to attend Mass. And what I like about what the bishops have done here, I mean, we, we know obligation, although I always say, I don't want you to go to Mass because you have to. I mean, that's a good start. But, I mean, hopefully our parishes are doing things to make the Eucharist, well, I mean, it's always efficacious, effective, but we're doing it well. I mean, Sunday is the best shot we have. How many people come to Bible study or to adult faith formation? Sunday's my best shot as the presider, as the pastor, to help people understand who God is. I got eight minutes Maybe 15 if it's good. <laughs> Though then they're looking at their watches. Anyway, but this is the beautiful thing the bishops say. This last point. Let no one deprive the church by staying away. If they do, they deprive the body of Christ of one of its members. Now, how many of you think about that? Or if you fell away from the church at some point thought, you know... By not being there today, I'm really hurting the body of Christ. I mean, it's a whole different way of comprehending it, isn't it? That when I'm not there, it's not just that I'm being hurt, even if I don't realize it, because I'm not receiving that antidote to my selfishness, but I'm hurting Christ's body on earth because it's incomplete. I'm depriving the body from being its true self. Oh, man. And that should move us to go for them, shouldn't it? Because we want our body to be healthy. Just like we take care of the physical body, we want the spiritual body, the church, to be well. Okay. Our response then. Oh, that's just the gift. Now we've got to get into our response. So, I mean, if there's that much of a gift, just think of what we have to do. Thanksgiving and worship, transformation in Christ, conversion and food for the journey. Let's go, Molly. i got to home. All right. Obviously, active and conscious participation. In the Second Vatican Council, which I'm going to spend the next section, session talking about the Constitution on the Liturgy from the Second Vatican Council, because I become convinced that too many people don't understand or have been taught wrongly about the Second Vatican Council and its importance in the church. It is the guiding force in the church, and it's a good thing. It is not a bad thing. And so if you're hearing voices, say, Satan, go to hell, if they're saying that, because that's not from God. So we're going to break into um, the teachings right from the Council Fathers in regard to the liturgy in our next session together. But in, it's there in, in the Constitution on the Liturgy that um, the... Fathers of the church say we need active, full active conscious participation. How does that happen, the bishops tell us? And this is part of our thanksgiving. Attention to the words of prayers and scriptures, so not going into Catholic cruise control. You know, okay, Father started, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts. Okay, he's going to say his thing, then i got to be ready for holy, holy, holy. No, i got to pay attention, especially to that preface, that prayer. It's seasonal. It unpacks what we're doing at the Mass this day. And listening to the homily. Now, I hear Father John is quite the homilist, and I have tuned in to listen at times, and he is a very good homilist, so I trust you're all doing that. Um, and then reflecting, not just listening, but since 
the, the priest is the Lord's minister, his instrument to break open the word, not just to give a sermon, which is about Father talking about whatever he wants, whether it's about the upcoming festival or we need money for this. A homily, the scriptures inspire it. So therefore, if it's a living word, what is the call through the homilist to me? Singing and responding. Say that again for Molly's benefit. Singing and responding. All right. Someone at one of my parishes sent me an email yesterday. He talked to me a few months ago about the music. Uh, nothing new, right? And how we should do a survey about what people want to sing. Do you do surveys here for that? I don't think that's how liturgy works. Well, this week, let's get out the hymnal and we'll play Catholic bingo and pick out the hymns, you know? I, even as the presider, there are hymns I hate, I detest. But I'm not going to impose my preference on you. Because as long as that doesn't contradict faith, then it's no problem. Just because I don't like it, I won't even go into some of them. Anyway, um, we'll talk about it privately if you want. But th th and then he said to me, and Father, you, I said, I don't understand your line. He said, the singing is really sad. And I thought he's talking about the musicians and the cantors. Well, I said, I don't, I just emailed back, I don't understand what you're saying. He said, well, open your eyes and look out. No one's singing it. Sad. We should do a survey and I'll do it if you want. No, thank you. All right. And then kneeling, I want, and not to mention, I want to say, I do look out. And I notice half the time you don't have the hymn on your hand, buddy. Cut that part out of the video, okay? I didn't say the name. <laughs> the Catholic calisthenics are part of all this too, right? That the, the church uh, calls us to use our entire bodies. I mean, this was part of the argument in the pandemic, you know, as it began, people saying, well, our, our souls are more important than our bodies. And of course, I mean, the soul is for eternal life. But that was also a heresy in the early church, that we're either soul or body. I mean, we're called to take care of both, to nurture both. That's why I've lost 40 pounds, which the bishop noticed the other day. He's not shy about telling priests to lose weight. So whenever I see him, I always lose a few pounds first to cut him off at the pass. But anyway, uh, the church asks us to use our bodies as part of our prayer. So if you notice, when we pray, we stand, you know, like the prayer, the universal prayer. After the homily, the presider stands, and we all stand to pray. We sit to pay attention, to listen to the word. We sit so that we can hear, so that we're not distracted. It's a posture of openness, right? And we kneel in devotion, so in the presence of the Eucharist, right? The church doesn't just do this for the heck of it. There's nothing accidental about the way we worship. And so the bishops remind us, all this is part of our thanksgiving and worship. And then when we look at Mother Teresa, she says, when you look at the crucifix, you understand how much Jesus loved you then. When you look at the sacred host, you understand how much Jesus loves you now. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, again, it's the same sacrifice, right? And she's making that point. But we need to know that he loves us now, not just then. This is obvious, right? But it's not always obvious now for various reasons. And so we need the representation of the sacrifice of the cross, which is called the Eucharist. Okay. And there she is. And so in the celebration of the Mass, we are shown what love truly is. And from that love, we receive grace that enables us to imitate the love that Christ shows us. And here's the transformation. Remember, we said the sacraments are effective. Eucharistic transformation reaches out to every sphere of human life, to our familial and friendships, friendship relationships, and to the life of society as we go into the workplace, as we go to Bistro 163, as we go to the library, and we take Christ with us. It shapes society. That's why stop complaining about them, the people that don't come to Mass. We're the problem, <laughs> too. Because this is what Pope Francis keeps trying to remind us. You and I, brothers and sisters, have every reason to be hopeful 
to be joyful. That's why his encyclical is called Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. He says, if anyone has reason to have joy, it's you and me. Because we know what Christ is about. And we have Christ with us in word and sacrament. And we take him into the world. The problem, isn't it, is that we keep sinning too. And so we have the opportunity through the Eucharist to transform society. As Vatican II says in the uh, Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the World, Gaudium et Spes, that the church is called to be a leaven in society. That's all I can tell you about baking. I don't know anything else, okay? Partic and then it's your role, not mine, to transform society which is the teaching of Vatican II and Lumen Gentium, the constitution on the church. It's your job, not the priest. Those days are over. Where father and sister does it all, we know that. But in, those, in Vatican II, we're told that you go into the world. I mean, I just go to a rectory. <laughs> I mean, I go to meetings, I go to the hospital, but I'm not in the workplace. I'm not at the park with my kids. You'd be calling the bishop if I was. And so um, you, the whole point is that you, the lady, this is your vocation. I think of myself as a coach. And every Sunday, it's halftime. And it's my job to give you a kick in the rear end. And myself. It's kind of difficult, though. I'm more, that's why I'm losing weight. So I can reach. But here, it's my role like a coach in that locker room at halftime. Get together. Come on. We only have so much more time to do this. You can do it. That's my responsibility. And then you get the oomph you need from the Eucharist, from medicine for the soul, to go back into the game. And this game is the salvation of souls, brothers and sisters. And so... Teresa of Calcutta, of course, is the example of that. It was her deep faith in the Eucharist and her reception of Holy Communion that motivated her loving care of the poorest of the poor and commitment to the sanctity of all human life. In beholding the face of Christ in the Eucharist, she learned to recognize his face in the poor and suffering, and she changed her world. Okay. And of course, whatever is opposed to life itself poisons human society. But Gaudium et Spes, the Second Vatican Council, which is, this is what, it's a picture of it in the Vatican Basilica, St. Peter's. They do more harm to those who practice that poison than those who suffer from the injury. That one really struck me too. That I do more harm to myself than to another person. When I bring the poison that is contrary to the Eucharist into the world, instead of bringing the antidote of the Eucharist. The bishops even go on in this document to make a connection, as Pope Francis does in his uh, encyclical Laudato Si, that there's a connection between the Eucharistic celebration and care for the environment. Because, of course, the way we worship brothers and sisters, we use the fruits of the earth. Bread, wine, water, oil, incense, all that comes from the earth. And we even say, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received this bread, this wine, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. And therefore, the Eucharist motivates us to care for the earth because we receive the Eucharist as gift from God, as gift from God's creation. And then there's a call, of course, beyond indifference. And it comes through grace, Right? That when I leave here, I can't be indifferent about things. The Eucharist calls me to make a decision to know who I am in Christ, to stand for him. Okay, conversion, and we'll just go through this quickly, but uh, of course, conversion is a lifelong process. That's why we don't call people who are welcomed into the church now converts, <laughs> Because conversion is something we all do. And so uh, there's a connection between the beginning of Christ's public ministry and the Eucharistic liturgy, right at the beginning. Uh, now I'm having the brain fart. I always say it, and now I've lost it. Uh, brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins so to prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. What Jesus did at the beginning, right? Going through Galilee, repent and believe. It's what we do at the beginning as we prepare to encounter him. We do the same thing. Nothing accidental. And then, of course, sin, and we know venial mortal. I'll skip that. This is where 
um, again, going into this document, many thought that the bishops were going to speak explicitly about um, who may and may not receive Holy Communion, especially public figures. And they treat that in paragraphs 48 and 49 here. Um, they say that public persons who have an obstinate rejection of defined doctrines break communion with the church, and there's the potential for them to cause scandal. Uh, and as that happens, the, the scandal is that it could cause other Catholic Christians to lose their resolve to remain faithful. That's the p potential scandal uh, of someone presenting themselves for Holy Communion when they're not ready for it. Uh, but they remind us, and I think this is an important thing for us, the church is not made up of vigilantes, brothers and sisters. All of this belongs to the ministry of the bishop, to the ministry of the chief shepherd of the diocese, to the ministry of the successor to the apostles. He's the pastor, and so he gets to respond. We can have opinions, don't get me wrong, but I don't think also we want to bring further division into the church. We want to leave that to the ministry of the successor to the apostles, whose responsibility, and the reason why it's his responsibility, of course, is the bishop's right. They are the guardians of sacramental integrity, which is important. And they are responsible for the promotion of salvation of souls. That's why it belongs to the office of bishop to deal with those very pastoral matters. Okay. We're almost done here. Finally, they say the Eucharist is food for the journey, which is what viaticum means, the final sacrament of our lives, right? Viaticum, communion for the dying, which means food for the journey. And so here, Carlo Acutis. I love Carlo Acutis. You know his story? Canonized or uh, beatified in 2020, October of 2020. Died at 15, 16 years old. Italian boy, lived in London with his parents, and uh, is buried in Assisi, in the basilica there. And uh, Carlo Acutis had a, a website, which is still available. He documented, as a teenager, all the Eucharistic miracles in the world. <laughs> Made a website of it. <laughs> and Carlo Acutis said, the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. A 15-year-old boy. <laughs> the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. And then people would say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? To always be united with Christ. This is my life's program. I, look, this is a modern figure. This is a photo from just a few years ago. He died in 1996, I think. And so um, I have I love Blessed Carlo Acutis. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, the first U.S.-born saint, was Episcopalian. And when her husband died, some family friends really took her in and watched over her and her children, and they were Catholic. And she became intrigued by their devotion to the Eucharist. So Elizabeth Seton became Catholic, was received into full communion, and of course is the patron of Catholic education in our country, started a community of women religious to educate the poor, because of the Eucharist, and because of others living their commitment to the Eucharist. It's not just she came into a church one day and there was the monstrance on the altar. It was those living tabernacles in her friends that drew her to the Eucharist. So she said, at last, God is mine and I am his. Oh, thanks be to God. One more slide, I think. The final piece is called Sent Forth. And this is a photo I took in 2010, right across the street. And I found it last night. All that is needed, the bishops say, is for one who has known this love of the Eucharist, that love that is displayed most preeminently, the love of Christ, displayed most preeminently in the Eucharist, to tell other people about it. That doesn't mean with words, necessarily. It could. But grandparents don't necessarily go home and start saying, why aren't you going to Mass and receiving the Eucharist? I heard today from this priest, you got to do it. And there was a 15-year-old in Italy who had it together. He said, the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. Why aren't you like that? No, no, no. 
Instead, I think we want to look for, first of all, it comes down to how we live our everyday lives, remembering that we are living tabernacles. And as ministers of Holy Communion, an extra responsibility as we offer the Eucharistic presence of Christ to our brothers and sisters to be living that call especially, to be a little more mindful. That's why I'm so grateful you are doing this today. Thank you again. But to look then for organic opportunities to share faith, not to force it with the grandchildren, but to have opportunities as they're talking about what's important to them, what's going on in their lives, to say, you know, thanks for sharing that with me. I can see how that shapes you, how important that is to you. Can I tell you about Father John's homily last week? Not because I, I think you need to hear it, but because it was important to me. I want to tell you the insight I got from it. And maybe you'll have something from it too once you hear it. Or I had this encounter at Eucharistic Exposition as I knelt before the Lord present in the Most Blessed Sacrament and I felt this peace come over me and I haven't had that feeling in such a long time and I didn't ask for it, it just happened. I'm not telling you that to make you feel guilty. I'm just sharing with you what's important to me, my life. Like those people did for Elizabeth Seton. It's not going to be hitting people over the head. It's not going to be preaching on street corners. It's going to be personal relationship. Having that relationship with Christ first and being moved by his selfless love to share that with others. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Father Scott. That was wonderful. <laughs> wonderful food for thought for us to continue reflecting on together. I and mean, thank you so much for especially giving us a sense that we're not just automatons at Mass, that we really need to think about how we spiritually enter into the sacrifice of the Mass. So thank you. Um, we're going to keep moving forward right now. I believe, Jan, if you'd like to come forward. What we have next for our um, Eucharistic ministers is a little bit of refresher session, and then we'll also be training any new people that we have um, today. So I'll give this over to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Father Scott. Thank you. I hate to bring us all back to uh, Earth, but... Um, <laughs> Most of the uh, regulations and guidelines we've been following are still in place. Nothing really has changed other than two things, and that has to do with positioning us when we distribute communion. The first is over, when you're over here by Our Lady of Guadalupe, Father is asking this this distributor to stand back on this uh, dark square. On, it'll, it'll give more room for people going around. Also, when he is distributing on the tongue, he will be able to um, be more available to the people who want to receive on the tongue. The second thing is um, over by the piano and the organ area, if that minister, when they are finished with their line, if they go to move, and you can't really see it, but if they would stand in front of the um, lectern so that the minister, the cantor, and the organist or the piano can see them more readily. Also, there are times um, when they don't wish to receive communion for one reason or another, it's more um, uh, visible for them to show the distributor by a simple nod of the head that the distributor doesn't have to wait for them. Otherwise, please remember to always wait, but to move yourself over, 
not to crowd the steps so much. Let the um, uh, music ministers come to you. And those are the basic changes um, for anyone new or anyone who would like refresher, uh, please stay. Otherwise, you can go and enjoy a cookie. <laughs> and um, you also are very welcome. I know we have lots of people who participate in multi mul multiple ministries here, so please stay for a second presentation. You already, I think, got a taste of some of the things Father Scott's planning to talk about there. So. Um, commissioning, oh yes, for uh, Corpus Christi, yes, we are going to do a commissioning of our Eucharistic ministers at Corpus Christi Mass, that would be June 18th and 19th weekend, so um, that's all Masses, so be prepared for that, that you will, uh, usually I think that you stand up for that and then uh, receive our sick certificates, we'll have those too, so. Um, okay, so, Is any new ministers, yes. if they would stay and come forward, um, so we could go over mm -hmm. the nuts and bolts of, of, of the um, ministry. Yeah, and please feel free to stick around, and of course, if you have questions for Father too in the interim here, we can always talk with him as well. Um, we are going to try to congregate back here at 10.30, um, to begin our second presentation. Okay, thank you.
is a little different, but it, it, a lot of it has to do with our new piano. Come and stand about here and face them. Don't crowd them. Um, don't stand too close. right up here and they almost feel like we're getting in their face. <laughs> they don't have room to they don't have room to receive reverently. So that's what and this is the so stand up here and you won't be in anyone's way because the line will be so So just wait here after they have received then you can individual, adult, child, comes up with their, how I, I usually bless them on the forehead. Sign of the cross. 
Attention again, please. Can I have your attention, please? I'd like to have everyone's attention. Um, this is our second presentation coming up very shortly in the next minute or two. This is directed to all our liturgical ministers, so for our Eucharistic ministers, as well as we have all of our other participating liturgy ministries. Uh, Father Scott Woods is going to speak to all of us about our enrichment. Um, so we do have that coming up in a minute. Um, 
Also, let's see, I know Steve Fillmore, if you can come forward, he wants to give us a brief announcement about CAFE. As well as I want to say thank you to everyone who's not a Eucharistic minister, who's part of hospitality and lectures only for being here. As part of CAFE, uh, we've always tried to, to emphasize the adult faith enrichment. And you're not going to get that just once a, once a week sitting here at Mass. Father Scott already told us that once this morning, and he's probably going to tell us that again. But what's going to, uh, what you're going to pull out of this um, too is what we've been, we the Adult Faith Enrichment and Evangelization Team has been uh, promoting, at least since Christmas, is the Mass. The Mass is the very basic aspect of being Catholic. That, that and of course the true presence of the, of the Blessed Sacrament. And Father went through some of it this morning with the Eucharistic ministers, and I think he's going to also hit part of it again about why we do what we do during Mass and the importance of, of everything that we do. So I'm taking the opportunity at the urging of my other team members that I have a sign-up sheet for those of you who want to study the Mass that we've been promoting, a biblical walk through the Mass where all of the different parts of the Mass uh, originated comes right out of the Old and the New Testament. It's only five sessions, one, two, three, four, five. You can get it done in a week, you can get it done in five weeks, you can get it done in five months, that's up to your group. And there's a video, there's a book to read, and it's very, it is very enriching in what we find out about why things are repeated three times, why, you know, why when you hear the priest sometimes will say, uh, in the order of Melchizedek. Some of you have heard that. Others are saying, he just made that up. I didn't, did I? <laughs> so I have a sign-up sheet, please, if you're interested. Some of you I already know are interested. We've got your names, but we're trying to put together the small groups. And our church did start out in small groups. And, there's, and it's been very effective. Look how big the Catholic Church is. Thank you, and thank you, Father. Thank you, Steve. Okay, um, for anyone who has just arrived here, just a reminder that we do have a sign-in sheet that's on the, on the table right there in the gym. So if you have not signed in, um, please do that at some point before you leave this morning. Um, let's see, I think there's one other announcement I'm supposed to... Again, I'm having a little brain fart right now. So, okay, um, hopefully I will, it'll come back to mind. So, yes. <laughs> Okay. All right. So well, I'm delighted to have Father Scott uh, present to us again. So now he's going to, again, give us a presentation directed to all of our liturgical ministers, uh, Eucharistic, uh, cantors. We have hospitality. I see all sorts of people here. Um, so the way this is going to work, just to give you um, a sense of the timeline, Father Scott will speak and present. And then after that, we do have our breakout sessions. Um, so I will give you specific directives after Father Scott is done with his presentation about where you will be assigned to go so you can do a little bit of refreshment training for each of your ministries. So with that, uh, thank you again. Thank you, Molly. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to uh, extraordinary, extraordinary ministers for uh, being daring enough to sit through another one. And uh, welcome to all the other liturgical ministers. Glad to be with you. Um, what I want to do uh, is I was wrestling with uh, what should we do, what's going to be helpful to folks. I, I thought, um, I I've become convinced in my own parishes that uh, most people don't even know what the Second Vatican Council was about. If I asked you right now, you might tell me that Vatican II changed the Mass from Latin to English, right? What else did Vatican II do? I'm going to put you on the spot. What? Priests faces the people, so as they, now we've got to go back to Latin, right? So ab populorum instead of ad orientum, not to the east, but to the people, yep. What else? So this is good. We're talking a lot about liturgy. Latin to English, priest turns around. Anything else? 
Not in all places, but in some places. And uh, uh, what I would say about that is, you know, in every generation, uh, we strive to do our best interpreting. And the church is a pendulum. It swings back and forth. And uh, we're recovering some of that now. Uh, In fact, at my parish in Millersville, they tore out the high altar and things in 1987. Normally that happened in the 70s. In parishes, they waited till 1987, and now I just have a blank brick wall with a crucifix on it and cheap wood paneling. It was all the rage back then, right? And uh, we're right now working on a new design for the sanctuary. With our, we uh, made our goal and went beyond our goal for the Living Christ campaign. You know, the diocese is doing a capital campaign. It's coming to a parish near you soon, and uh, we made our goal. And so, as the money comes in, as people fulfill their pledges, we're going to redo the sanctuary to beautify it. So thank you, you're right. I'm, that was an unfortunate thing. Anything else? All of it has to do with liturgy, and I think that's where we see it most, right? But that's why I want to unpack this. We priests have not done a good job of helping you understand what is the driving force in the church today. There hasn't been a Vatican III. We're still 50 years into this council and unpacking what it means as that pendulum swings back and forth. So let's jump in. This is, by the way, this is an image of Vatican II, one of the sessions, obviously in St. Peter's Basilica. So Molly, please. Uh, Let's say a prayer to start, and then I want to give you a brief overview of Vatican II. I want to focus in on the Constitution and the liturgy, and then a brief reflection and closing prayer. Whew! We're going to cover all this. No, not all of it. Oh, by the way, what is the timeline? When should I be done? No, no. I have a quinceanera. You all are lucky. I have a quinceanera mass at 1 o'clock in Fremont, so you have a reprieve. 1130. Okay, good. Let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord our God, we praise you and thank you for the gift of the church and for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that love binding you, Father, with your Son, Jesus, that spirit that was poured out into the world at that first Pentecost and gave birth to the church, that spirit that in every age has guided the leaders of the church to provide for the good of your holy people so that we might journey together as a pilgrim church to the joy of heaven. Bless our church today. Bless our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and our diocesan bishop, Daniel Thomas, our pastor, Father Jonathan, and all you have called to serve your church as priests, deacons, religious, and lay faithful who build up the church by their holy service. Help us always do everything to glorify you and to serve your people, the church in the world. Through Christ, our risen Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so let's jump into this. we got a lot to cover. Uh, we did that. Now, Vatican II. One more slide, please. Okay, Vatican II is officially called the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. It's called uh, ecumenical because it includes the whole world. You know, today when we talk about ecumenism, we talk about Christian unity, Right? Uh, but ecumenical in the church's size is the whole world. And that's why it makes sense talking about Christian unity, right? Trying to draw together all Christians into one. There's, it's the highest teaching authority in the church. There's no higher teaching authority. That's why I'm saying Vatican II is the guiding force in the church's life today. And why it's so important then for you and me to know what it calls us to be about. Because it provides the direction. There's been 21 councils in the history of the church. Vatican II is number 21. The first one was at Nicaea, 325, and we, of course, get the Nicene Creed. This council was called because of crisis. Some of you have done adult formation in church history. Of course, there's heresies that are tearing apart the church, and from the perspective of the emperor Constantine, more importantly, tearing apart the empire. And therefore, the emperor tells the pope, get together with your people and figure this out. Remember, it was only 12 years earlier that he issued the Edict of toleration, which made Christianity legal, moving from those small groups and homes, as Steve was talking about, into basilicas, government palaces. 
And so the emperor calls together the church to to work out this whole idea of the divinity of Jesus, that he's fully God and fully man. Crisis brought the first council together. The next one, well, not the next, but the next one I'll hit would be the 19th council, the Council of Trent, which is also known as the Counter-Reformation because it is called in response to the Protestant Reformation of 1517. Now, of course, back then we didn't have phones or internet, but we also pick on the church for moving slowly sometimes, right? So the Protestant Reformation begins October 31st, 1517, and notice the Council of Trent begins in 1545, and it lasted until 1563. The church called this together to address the various um, beefs, if you will, of the reformers. Now, we owe Luther gratitude because he was right on many things, including indulgences. The church can't sell salvation. Duh, this makes no sense. We don't give salvation, God does. And yet we were selling salvation to the rich. Makes no sense. Luther was right about that. Luther was wrong, however, about the fact that he says there's only two sacraments, not seven. And Luther, of course, was a priest and went to confession almost daily. He was so scrupulous personally. And so Trent goes on and we get seminaries because of Trent. There was no set program of priestly formation before the Council of Trent, which explains why there were so many abuses in the church too. And then, so again, that's called out of crisis. There's Vatican I in the 19th century, but a war in Europe called that off early. The biggest thing out of that is papal infallibility. All right? And then we get to 1959 and the election of Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli to be Bishop of Rome. He takes the name John the 23rd, known as Good Pope John, the Smiling Pope. A lot of people thought that when Pope Francis came out on the balcony in 2013, he looked a lot like Pope John the 23rd in his physical appearance. And John the 23rd shocks the world on uh, January 25th, 1959, the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul, he announces to the world that he's convening an ecumenical council. Everyone's saying, what for? We're not in crisis. There's no crisis right now. And uh, John the 23rd, uh, let's go forward, in fact. He sees this as an opportunity rather than a crisis. I'll come back to him. Here's the popes who have served since in Vatican II. John the 23rd, who died then in 1963 of cancer. It was carried on by Pope St. Paul VI, who is of particular fame because he uh, wrote the encyclical letter Humanae Vitae on human life. Pope John Paul I, who of course only served 30 days and then died an untimely death, followed by Pope St. John Paul II, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, and of course, Pope Francis. So these are the popes of Vatican II. John XXIII opens it. Paul VI really carries it out, and we would say in many ways, John Paul II implemented it, all right? Now, here's what John XXIII says, and there he is. He says, we're going to have a, oh good, I got the date right. Look at that, phew. A giornamento, he says, which is an Italian word for fling open the windows. We're going to open the windows of the church and we're going to let the fresh air into it. And we're going to bring the church, even though it's not of the world, the church is in the world. And so we're going to bring the church into dialogue with the modern world. So this it's called the Second Vatican Council because like the First Vatican Council, it was held at the Vatican from 1962 to 1965. It gathers all the bishops of the world, about 2,600 bishops, including the Bishop of Toledo, would have gone to Vatican City for the Second Vatican Council. At that time, that would have been Arch, no, not Altar, it would have been Raring, Bishop Raring, if any of you were confirmed by him. Uh, and so there's been a debate since then about, well, was Vatican II about continuity in the church or rupture, meaning a whole new beginning? And theologians and ecclesiologists, that's people who study the church, ecclesiology, um, said, well, it's, it's continuity. 
There's no breaking, a uh, uh, rupture, if you will. It's a new vision for the church. It's a new experience for the church. But one of the key words, in addition to a giornamento, one of the key words is ressourcement, a French word that basically means reclaiming. And so it, what was important to the council fathers was to go back to the tradition of the early church. So much had crept into the church through the Middle Ages. Not bad, but they said, we need to recover. We need to reclaim the tradition of the early church, ressourcement, back to the original sources. And so the council fathers were appealing to tradition. That's why today some people say, I'm a traditional Catholic, right? And they say that to mean, I'm not into this Vatican II stuff. Well, I'm as traditional as you. Vatican, I, I'm not saying that to be flippant. I mean, there's a place for these other expressions of Catholicism that came from the Middle Ages. We have a parish in downtown Toledo devoted to it, in fact. Uh, St. Joseph, where the extraordinary form of the Mass is celebrated every single Sunday. And that's good. But, Vatican, and I know Father John did the extraordinary form here for his anniversary last year. But, Vatican II is reaching back to the earliest tradition. And so the church is not untraditional all of a sudden. Okay? And the, what, so what they're trying to do is repair this disconnect between the ancient and the modern church. Not a rupture. Continuity. John the 23rd said in particular, his phrase was, we need to be alert to the signs of the times. Not meaning the church is going to change on a whim, that we're going to go with whatever everyone else is saying we should do, but we're going to be alert to what's happening around us so that we can respond to it, so that we can bring scripture and tradition to bear on society. We're not of the world, but we're in the world, and we have something to contribute to the world, he says. And so he says, we're not on earth to guard a museum, but to cultivate a flowering garden of life. The church can't be a museum, it's a garden where Christ is continually bringing forth new life. So they, the council fathers over those four years produced 16 documents. There's constitutions, declarations, and decrees. Constitutions, there's four of them. These are the most important, and so that's why here, they're in the center, okay? Because obviously the one we're going to talk about here, Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, since we're here for liturgy, uh, the uh, Dei Verbum, which is the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, so it has a lot to do with Scripture, how God reveals himself. Lumen Gentium, the, const the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. So think about the Constitution of the United States. Lumen Gentium is laying out, here's what the church is fundamentally. And then, additionally, Gaudium et Spes, which is the constitution on the church in the modern world. Because the church is this, this is what the church is in relation to the modern world. Okay? Let's go forward, please. We're not going to talk about decrees and declarations. You can do that on your own. They're all online, or you can get it in book form. Um, so on the 4th of December, 1963, uh, Pope St. Paul VI uh, signed the uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, known as Sacro Sanctum Concilium. And here's what this is about. There are seven chapters, and I'm, we're not going to go through all of these. We're going to focus in on the first few, but I want you to see what they address. And of course, post, in a post-conciliar church, since the closing of the council, there's been a lot more documents. We just covered one, Eucharistic Ministers, from the U.S. bishops, okay? And much of what I quoted to you comes out of that book. <laughs> the, the, so that's what I'm saying. I told you, Eucharistic Ministers, that there's nothing new, really, the bishops could say about the Eucharist. They could just refocus it. And what were they doing? Going back to the driving force in the church. You open up the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is filled with footnotes. You look at the footnotes. It's quoting the Second Vatican Council. That's what I'm saying. This is foundational to everything about the church today. And we don't even know it. We priests haven't shared it with you well enough. We've taken it for granted. 
And then other voices say, oh, Vatican II is awful. And we haven't even helped you understand what it's about. And so here, the first chapter, general principles for the restoration and progress of the sacred liturgy. A restoration, not a starting over. And so I'll tell you, for instance, English in the Mass. People thought this was this great innovation. This isn't traditional, having the Mass in English. Well, the Mass originally was in what language? No, Greek. And because the church grows up in that area. Remember, the New Testament, the Septuagint, is written in Greek. The Old Testament's in Hebrew. St. Jerome translated the New Testament from Greek to Latin. And we got the Vulgate, as it's called, okay? By the way, the New American Bible we use in the lectionary that you have at home, that came out of Vatican II, the scholars went back to the original, see, resource mont. They didn't start with the Latin text. They went all the way back to the Hebrew and Greek and translated to English from Hebrew and Greek. We went back to the original source, okay? But by the fourth century, the church has spread west to Rome. And the Romans are praying the Eucharist. And I'm sure, I don't know for certain, but I would think this is where the phrase, it's all Greek to me, comes from. <laughs> because the Romans, as they're praying the Eucharist, turn to each other and say, do you know what we're saying? Do you know? Uh-uh. No one knew what they were praying. And so they asked, well, couldn't we pray in our own language? And what did they speak in Rome? Latin. The Mass has always been in the language of the people, what we call the vernacular. This isn't new. Vatican II doesn't do something radical. It goes back to the tradition that has always been the case. That's why I'm saying, to say that the English Mass is not traditional is false. And we have to know that. Because there's become too much division over that. There's nothing wrong with going to Mass in Latin. I'm going to do part of the quinceañera at 1 o'clock in Fremont in Spanish. It's fine. But we've got to stop saying one person traditional and one person isn't. We don't need that division from society and the church. So, off the soapbox. Chapter 2, Sacred Mystery of the Eucharist. Chapter 3, the other sacraments and the sacramental. So how should baptism be celebrated? Vatican II uh, has directions for baptism. Extreme unction, which will henceforth be known as sacrament of the sick, anointing of the sick. The divine office, the liturgy of the hours that we uh, priests, religious, deacons, and lay people pray. The liturgical year, renewal of that. Sacred music is chapter six. And sacred art and furnishings dictating how this church should look. All starts here. Let's go forward, please. So I just want to take a little bit from this document that's specific to the liturgy since all of us together are involved in providing the liturgy for the people. You, specifically for the people of Immaculate Conception. God is calling. If it's the Pope, I'm not talking. God, yes. Okay. Um, so, of course, and we covered this, Eucharistic ministers, and you know this already, but it bears repeating over and over again. That it's, for the, the Council Fathers say in the Constitution on the Liturgy that there's a fourfold presence of Christ in the Liturgy. And so, of course, he's first and foremost in the Eucharist, right? But the Liturgy of the Eucharist and the Liturgy of the Word together constitute the Mass. And so Christ is present in the Word. After all, he is the eternal living Word. And so when the scriptures are proclaimed at Mass, lectors, when you do that, remember, don't ever, please, and I know at Immaculate Conception, you have your act together. I was saying that earlier. You all are so good at providing opportunities like this to make sure you are well-formed and serving your brothers and sisters well. So thank you for that. Your presence here today is a testament to it. But lectors, you do not read the readings. The people in the pews, if they're following in a missal, 
which is not the ideal, unless they have hearing disabilities, they read. You and I read. I can open this council book and read. You lectors proclaim. I tell people all the time, I don't need someone to get up and read. I need someone to get up and proclaim the word. If it's a living word, it needs to be proclaimed as such. If we need to know it's not just... Jesus said to his disciples, no, that's a history lesson. The disciples are gathered right now, sitting in these pews. And so that word needs to be proclaimed to help them recognize it is alive. And as the writer of the letter to the Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 12, it is a living, effective word that's able to pierce the human heart. So please, continue to proclaim the scriptures. And then, of course, we hope, (laughs) on good days, he's present in the presider, (laughs) you know? And that's why the presider, you know, we call this the presidential chair. And he's not sitting up here because he's more important, but because he has a special role in the priesthood of the baptized. He's been called forth from that priesthood that we all share in to uh, to the ordained priesthood to be in the person of Christ, the head, when he leads us in prayer. But... Christ is equally present in the gathered assembly. You. (laughs) That person, I know what they did last week. I saw them. (laughs) That person said something bad about me 26 years ago. No, I don't remember what it was, but I know they did it. Christ is present in the mass of our assembly. And so, in... Paragraph 11, the Council Fathers write, the faithful take part fully aware of what they are doing, actively engaged in the right and enriched by it. That's the ideal. I'm not so sure we're always actively engaged, and sometimes that's my fault. Let's go forward, please. So participation of the people. Paragraph 14, the Council Fathers write, in the restoration and development of the sacred liturgy, The full and active participation by all the people is the paramount concern. You are the paramount concern. Not just celebrating the sacrament, the people and your participation. My presidency at the Eucharist should help you pray better. For it is the primary, indeed the indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit. So, this is the end of pray, pay, and obey. Some of you say, well, I haven't obeyed for a long time. I'm good with that. No problem. And yet, remember back in the day, some of you, you just come in and Father's going to do his thing. Again, I mean no disrespect to the extraordinary form, but... He'll do his thing up here. Only the altar servers will respond, in fact. And that's why I'll be out here praying my rosary or my novena to St. Jude. And I'll make sure I put my money in when the basket comes around. And you know it's going to be on the stick because they're not going to let me touch it. No making change in the basket. And so all that's over. That's what paragraph 14 is saying, that now you have an active role. This is not the priest's show. Oh, two weeks ago today, five o'clock mass in Gibsonburg. I, during the collect, I thought, oh, geez, I don't think there's a lector. The deacon was there, so he carried the gospel book, and I realized a lector never walked in procession with us. We've only had an active deacon since September. So I thought, maybe they just forgotten. Here I'm saying, let us pray, and I'm thinking, I don't think we have a lector. And I sit down and I lean over to Deacon Mike. I don't think there's a lecture. He said, me neither. I said, then go do it. And so he goes and proclaims the readings and he comes back and he's about to ask the blessing for the gospel. I said, "Uh uh-uh, you did your part. I I get to do the gospel now. So I started the homily by saying, you know, we could really use more lectors. And I know all of you are saying, well, the readings were just proclaimed. But it's not his job and mine. I said, in fact, you see, he got demoted today. He had to do the first and second reading. I did the gospel because he did that. This isn't the show of the clergy. This is the work of the people, which is what liturgy means from the Greek word liturgia, public service, work of the people. So 
Let's go forward. End of pray, pain, obey. It's the work. Oh, see? It, I love it when it comes together. It's the work of the people. Let's go forward again. And so now the, the council fathers have things to say about the place of sacred scripture. And I was saying again how glad I am that you got a more substantial ambo, how nice uh, this piece is. And uh, they say it is from scripture that the petitions, prayers, and hymns draw their inspiration and their force, and that actions and signs derive their meaning. Let's go forward. We say, for instance, that the deposit of faith, that is what we believe, is handed on especially through music. That's why in recent years, as you know, Molly, we become a little more fussy about what we sing. We want to make sure that the, the hymns truly convey the spirit of Catholic Christian belief, right? Uh, and in the seminary, sometimes guys would complain, this song is heretical, to which the director of liturgy, a priest, would say, do you know better than the Archbishop of Chicago who gave his approval to the hymnal that it's in? That changed it a little. Now, some texts are more problematic, but we want to be careful because think about it. If I asked you right now, do you have a favorite scripture? Now, you lectors are going to say, of course, my favorite is, and then you're going to even quote it to me. You won't even need the book. But you ask someone in the pew tonight, do you have a favorite reading? No, not really. They're all good. you have a favorite song? Oh, I love On Eagle's Wings which I've come to really dislike, by the way. <laughs> Father Michael Jonkis, who composed it, made a lot of money off of a song that begins, Yoo-hoo! Anyway. They'll say, I don't have a favorite reading, but I love On Eagle's Wings. Well, guess what? You like Psalm 91. <laughs> On Eagle's Wings is pretty much word for word Psalm 91. And if you look in that hymnal right there at the bottom underneath, it's going to say, based on PS91. And so that's what I mean. You see, that our music, our hymnody, contains the deposit of faith. You may not be able to quote a scripture, but you could sing me on eagle's wings right now if I begged you to. And there's the faith, right? It's contained therein. Let's go forward. And so the, the importance of scripture, right? Think about prayers. Here again, scripture. The petitions, prayers, and hymns draw their inspiration, their force from the scriptures. When I got to Gibsonburg and Millersville, I operate, when I preside at Mass, on the principle of graduated solemnity. So tonight at Mass, since it's a Sunday, I'll greet the people after the sign of the cross and say, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. But on weekdays, I often say, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is one of the three options in the Roman Missal. The last one being the Lord be with you. Well, the first several times I said, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, there were crickets. They thought the priest of three years forgot the rest of it. It didn't mention the Holy Spirit anywhere. He forgot. We don't know what to do. And then sometimes we get a second reading from Paul where he begins his letter, Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to you because... And there, so there it is. Right there, brothers and sisters, in the very greeting of the priest to the people is Scripture. And so the whole Mass is resting on Scripture. We Catholics, our worship, so that's good, Steve. Here, he didn't even ask me to give a plug for what he just advertised about the biblical roots of the Mass, but there it is. You can pay me afterwards, okay? Let's go forward. What? Okay, no indulgences. No, not for pay anyway. We have indulgences, but they're not for sale. The universal prayer, formerly known as the prayer of the faithful, not the prayers of the faithful, it's one prayer, all together. Or the petitions, are, they're separate, right? Petitions are the prayer of the faithful, but now we call it the universal prayer because it's offered for the whole church and the world, right? And the imagery, like I, haven't written, I write the petitions at my parish, and I do that because I like to tie whatever I'm preaching about into the uh, petitions to reinforce it. 
And I'll go back and look at the readings, and I'll draw imagery from the readings into the petitions to reinforce the readings. So for me, it's a fruitful, it's my own prayer, my own way to prepare for Mass. By the way, I haven't done it yet for today. Oops. Anyway, but I don't have a homily either, so it's all good. Anyway, I want to teach you right now. If I asked one of you right now to stand up and lead us in prayer, you're just shuddering even at the thought of it, right? Now, if I asked you to lead the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Memorare, you'd probably be okay with that. But if I asked you to get up and right now lead us in spontaneous prayers, like, uh-uh, I'm Catholic. We don't do that. It's your job. Well, it's not my job. I'm going to teach you right now how to pray as a Catholic, okay? And so you can take any prayer in that Roman Missal that I want you to listen this weekend, and you will see this structure. You will be praying like a Vatican translator before you know it. And so the four words you need to know are you who, do, and through. And you can pray with the best of them. So right now, someone give me a title for God. Father, creator, what? Someone give me a title. Sister Peg, how should we address God? Oh, I said Sister Peg, hold on. Father? Okay, Um, how about um, who? What does the Father do? He creates, okay, I can buy that. Uh, What do we want him to do for us? Bless. Bless. So Father who creates, bless us, and it's through Christ, right? Our prayer is always in Christ. So here we go. Father in heaven, who create all things in your goodness and out of pure love, bless us and all of creation so that we might live our lives glorifying you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. There. We just did a spontaneous prayer. That's how every collect, the opening prayer of the Mass, is structured. You will be praying beautifully. And so when you have to pray at a wedding or a public event, you, who, do, and through. I address God with a particular title. A God, I acknowledge what God has done. That's the who, Right? I'm asking God to do something, that's the do, and then through Christ our Lord. There it is. Now in the petitions, one of the monks, who's a scripture scholar at St. Meinrad, told us, when you write the petitions, and Father Harry haunts me every day at Mass when I lead the petitions. He said, and this guy knows Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, all of it. He said, don't be heretics. Ask God to do something. Now, usually it's implied in our petitions. For instance, that the church might always proclaim Christ crucified and risen. Let us pray to the Lord. It's implied, right, that we're asking God to do it. But it's really, for the people who aren't tuned in, it's basically saying we can do that. We're praying that we'll do that, right? That we, the church, will do that. So if I, whenever I write the petitions, that Christ the Good Shepherd might lead his church to proclaim him faithfully. Let us pray to the Lord. See, I'm explicitly, and it's sending a message to the worshiping assembly that I'm asking God to do something. This doesn't ride on me. I stand humbly before God asking it. And it roots it in scripture, right? Okay, going forward. Who's writing the petitions this weekend? No, don't tell me. Okay. Um, They go on to say, Oh, I love this point. Liturgical services are not private functions, but are celebrations of the church, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's go forward there. See what I have next, Molly. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. I was in Chicago several years ago. I went for my master's degree there before I went to the seminary. And I was there on a weekend, the weekend before Christmas. And so Saturday night, I go into Holy Name Cathedral, the beautiful cathedral of the Archdiocese of Chicago, beautiful wood-paneled ceiling, and I go in for the Saturday Vigil Mass. And as I go in for the, like the 5 o'clock Mass or whatever time it was, they're still doing a wedding up front. Now, the cathedral's on State Street, the main drag, and the L runs right underneath it. You know, you can hear it in the cathedral. And so here, I, they're, the priest is still on the Our Father. The whole wedding party's up there and everything. And meanwhile, people are coming in in this third largest city in the United States and just going into the P 
pew sitting in the back, and then as soon as the wedding was done, they all moved forward to their normal seats for the five o'clock mass. Now think about it. We tell people, the wedding starts at two, you have to be out at four o'clock, mass is starting this time, blah, 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 blah. Because we, we imply your wedding is private. No, it's not. Your reception is private. You get to decide who comes there. But the wedding is public because it's a sacrament. None of our worship is private. But we enforce that idea. For instance, when I was the associate pastor in Finley, we had so many baptisms. And of course, some people wanted a private baptism. No, it's not private. We'll do an individual baptism, not a private one. The words matter. But the norm was to do it at Mass. That's where baptism should happen because it's a welcoming into the family of God. Therefore, while the nuclear family represents the family of God, right, the family of God should be there, complete with looking at their watches the whole time. <laughs> but our people are trained that. Why aren't they doing that privately? We've enforced that in our parishes. And we wonder why the lack of community exists in our parishes. They should be doing that on their own. We gotta get to breakfast. Someone's gonna get our table. Okay, next, please. Eucharistic adoration is not the same as Eucharistic exposition. If you were to come into this church and I wasn't running my mouth, and you knelt down and prayed before the most blessed sacrament reserved in the tabernacle there, you would be doing Eucharistic adoration. That's a private devotion. It's your prayer. Just like praying a novena is a private devotion unless it's done publicly. As soon as Father or Deacon or the Eucharistic minister take the Blessed Sacrament out of the tabernacle and put it in the monstrance, that becomes exposition. Christ is exposed, right? And that is public worship. So I'm very fussy at my parishes. No, we're not having adoration. We're having exposition. And it's public. See, words matter. It's not my private prayer. It's a public prayer. Even if it's all done in silence. Let's go forward. Servers. So again, this is 1963. Servers, readers, commentators, and members of the choir also exercise a genuine liturgical ministry. So thank you. This was not the case before this document. Now, there were servers, of course, we know. There was a commentator, there was a choir, but it was just sort of extra. No, you're essential to this now, exercising a genuine liturgical ministry, meaning it's necessary, it's needed. They ought, therefore, to carry out their functions with the sincere piety and decorum which is appropriate to so exalted a ministry and not which God, but which God's people rightly expect. That your fellow parishioners have the right to expect you to do what you do to the best of your ability. In the monastery, if one of the monks screwed up during prayer, say that he... Um, was chanting the wrong melody for the liturgy of the hours. At the end, the archabbot, the prior, and all the monks would come out of their choir stalls and process two by two into the monastery. And that monk who messed up, who did not do the best for his brothers, would have to kneel in front of them on the marble floor as all of his brother monks walked past him as a sign of repentance and humility for not giving his best. And then he would get up at the end and follow them in and life would go on. That was the end of it. And a lesson to not take it for granted next time. Let's go forward. Again, piety is a word that's thrown around so much, but I think the point here is they say uh, genuine piety, sincere piety. The, the point is, what's going on inside? Not do I have my hands like this, or folded, or what, but it's internal. So for instance, I never wore this outfit until the day I was ordained a deacon at Our Lady of Consolation Carry. 
I showed up and my classmates didn't have it on. And I said, am I dressed right? Am I supposed to be wearing this? Because after the Mass, we're going to be deacons. I never put on a clerical shirt or collar till that moment. Because the custom at my seminary was, you don't put on the externals until the internals are in order. I think it's the same for our piety that we bring to serving our brothers and sisters at the Mass. In his document on the priesthood, Pope St. John Paul II, uh, the document's called Pastoris Dabo Vobis, I Will Give You Shepherds. And Pope St. John Paul II says that the priest's personality should be a bridge between God and his people rather than a barrier. That's good advice for a priest. Uh, and we often get that wrong. And we take that to reconciliation. But I think it's good for any of us in ministry especially, don't you think? That what we do and the way we act outside of our ministry should help lead people to a deeper relationship with the Lord. Not that we're the Messiah, thank God. <laughs> but that we're not a barrier between God and that person that we treat our fellow parishioners with dignity, with respect. Not that we don't offer constructive criticism, but that we always do it with charity. We don't just nitpick. We don't look to fight. We don't look to be an instrument of division rather than one of unity. That gives a lot more credibility if we're going to exercise such an exalted ministry. Think about that, what you do. The church, the Roman Catholic Church says that what you do is exalted. In the reform of the liturgy, and uh, this is why many, much of the art was taken out. Not rightly so, but again, people doing their best with what they thought at the time, because the liturgy now has a noble simplicity. For instance, some of you might recall in the extraordinary form of the Mass, the priest was constantly making the sign of the cross over the Eucharistic elements. I mean, there were several repetitions of motions and things. And there wasn't necessarily a, a, a good reason. And that's why the, the reforms simplified it. So I make the sign of the cross over the elements one time now. Because it almost lent itself to superstition before, right? Father's got to get this just right. Now it's one. There's a noble simplicity. So the vestments we wear uh, shouldn't be ostentatious, but as Bishop Thomas would say, Father, they should be worthy for the liturgy. Worthy. What we use, what we do, should be worthy. So it's noble. What we do here is not just ordinary. It's noble, but it's simple. Simple meaning you know what we're doing. It's not totally foreign. Let's go forward with that thought. And, and that's what they say, that it should be with, within the people's powers of comprehension. So I told you about graduated solemnity, that people know if I chant the opening prayer, well, it's a special day. They know right away unless, um, versus speaking it. What else do we have here? The place of liturgical catechesis, what we're doing now. And again, I, I, I honor you as a parish uh, for doing this. I honor you as individual parishioners for making this commitment to exercise exalted ministry and to be here to learn more about what you do, why it matters. But for instance, you know, there's been a lot of critique since the 2011 release of that third edition of the Roman Missal in English. And, and some of that's rightly so. The, the critique has been from some priests that that translation, which is what we call a, a literal translation, meaning when I say, and with your spirit, or you say, and with your spirit, that's accounting for every word in Latin, et cum spiritu tuo, which in English is literally, and with your spirit, versus before, we had a dynamic translation. We captured the spirit of the meaning, but we didn't use the exact words. So et cum spiritu tuo in dynamic translation was, and also with you right? Some of the prayers are clunky. I practice them before the Mass, especially if I'm chanting them, so I know what to stress, where to pause, because in some ways, the, the, this translation violates this principle. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the prayers, some of them, the sentences are like St. Paul wrote them. They're so long. And, and so the priest presider really has to concentrate to make sure, especially if you don't have it in front of you, 
that he's praying it in a way that you can hear and comprehend to the best of your ability. Because some of it's not short, clear, or free from useless repetition. That said, I don't change that text. I don't have the authority to. It's not my mass. It's not Bishop Thomas's mass. It's the church's liturgy. Please. Recep uh, receiving Holy Communion, the more perfect form, oh this, will, oh, this drives me nuts. The more perfect form of participation in the Mass, whereby the faithful, after the priest's communion, receive the Lord's body from the same sacrifice is warmly recommended. In other words, and don't yell at Father John, don't say, Father Scott said, if this is what you do here, we've changed it in my parish. Communion, for you, should not regularly come from here, according to the bishops, or according to the council fathers. Because every time we gather, we offer the sacrifice of the Lord. And so what they're saying is, it's ideal that you receive Holy Communion consecrated at that Mass where you are participating not from last Sunday's Mass, because we put too many hosts out. Remember, the, our parishes, we don't do this. So it, it, last week, the sacristan, I consolidated the Blessed Sacrament after communion. The ciborium was full in the tabernacle. So tonight, we'll be using the tabernacle. But that shouldn't be the norm. We should be looking to see how many people are here and adjusting the count. Because, I mean, think about it, especially like at a funeral. You're there praying for your loved one. There's something comforting, and maybe we don't even think about it, but for me as the presider, I do. There's something comforting about receiving Holy Communion from the Mass offered for my loved one. To share in that communion with them. Now, it's not that there's less communion. <laughs> it's not Jesus goes away. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But the tabernacle was created for two reasons. The first reason was to reserve Holy Communion for the sick who could not be part of our Eucharistic assembly on Sunday. That was the only reason, to hold the Blessed Sacrament for them. And over time, to hold the Blessed Sacrament for adoration. Not to be, well, that's where we get communion from. Again, is it bad? No. But the Council Fathers say we should really strive to receive from that Mass. Now, I violate that in Fremont because I told them, because we have different retired priests filling in every Sunday, where I'm the presbyteral moderator right now, because I'm at Gibsonburg and Millersville, I told Deacon Mel at St. Joe's and St. Anne's, always have enough consecrated hosts in the tabernacle for a Sunday Mass in case the priest doesn't show up. That's a different thing, right? I want to guide us through a reflection here. Let's go forward, and then we're going to wrap up, and it's time for that anyway, I see. Um, Lexio Divina, some of you may be familiar with that prayer form. Uh, it's the Benedictines who formed me at the seminary have done this for 1,500 years. They do it every day, and it's a beautiful way to pray. For those of us who say, I don't get anything out of the scriptures, this prayer is for you, because as you pray this, it is the Lord speaking to you. In Lexio Divina, which literally means holy reading, um, it's structured prayer with scripture, and there's four R's to guide you. Let's go forward, Molly, please. So the first one, Lexio, read. Next, Meditatio, or reflect. Contemplatio, or rest. And Oratio, respond. Read, reflect, rest, respond. We take a scripture, it doesn't have to be long, we read it first, and we just sit there with it for a moment. We don't do anything with it. We read it again, and we do our next R. We reflect and say, what word or phrase captures my attention? Not why, but just which word or phrase captures my attention? Next, contemplatio. I'm just going gonna, gonna to read it again, and I'm just going to sit with it. I'm going to ask then, why? I'm going to read it one more time, and it leads me to respond. What do I need to do? What is the Lord in this living word calling me to do? See, that's what I'm saying. This, in Lexio Divina, it is God speaking to us in Scripture. So what is he asking me to do? Who is he calling me to pray for? What relationship do I have to mend? 
I want to do Lexio with you, mindful of your exalted ministry. I want to use the second reading of tomorrow's Mass and do this briefly. We won't take the long time to go through all the steps, but let's go to tomorrow's reading from Revelation 21. Let's have a lector proclaim it for us. You may have to come up here to see it. We have a lector willing to do that? Oh, yeah, Steve, you've been nominated. Come on down, proclaim this for us, please, so we can do some Lexio Divina so the Lord can speak to us. Proclaim. Yes, Father. Then I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will, and they will bless his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race, he will dwell with them as they will be his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. What is the Lord inviting you to do in response to that word or phrase for your ministry? 
not gonna invite you to turn and share it with someone. If we had more time, I'd make you uncomfortable and do that. Maybe you will have the opportunity the rest of the day here to share that with someone. This is what the Lord placed on my heart for my ministry. Let's go forward. And again, you can do this prayer on your own very simply. Read, reflect, rest, respond. Um, I've shared this with you this morning because you are the liturgical leaders along with Father John, with Molly, for this parish. And I think it's important, as I said, for us to know the church's vision for this liturgy. This is just a small piece, the foundation from 60 years ago this year when Vatican II began. So much more is developed, but it's all developed based on this. You need to know as ministers how it developed, what the church calls you to be about. Not father, not bishop, but the council fathers of the highest teaching authority in the Roman Catholic Church. So that you can be leaders not only in your ministry, but also you can help others understand the richness of Catholic worship. The priest can't do it alone. Those days are long gone but you can help and you must as people who have been called by the church to help make Christ present through what you do with our worship. So we'll forego our closing prayer and I just want to uh, thank all of you uh, for your time, for your attention. I'm always grateful to be here with you and have a warm place in my heart for this parish uh, since I was here 12 years ago. So thanks very much. Let's end with a blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you and your loved ones wherever they are, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thank you, Father Scott. Let's give him a round of applause. Yes, wonderful presentation for us to all reflect on. And I think we can head into that now, kind of just piggy right back on what um, Father Scott was talking about. So we're going to go into our breakout sessions. Um, what I'd like to have happen now is we have um, homebound ministers. Um, if you participate in that, you'll be um, in the gym at the tables there. Uh, hospitality ministers, I'd like you guys to go over to the um, long side in the back of church over here. And then our cantors and lectors here today, um, if you can just come to the front here and we will be meeting with you. Appreciate it.